Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Columbus. It's good to see you. The, uh, the, uh, we're delighted to have uh, some visitors with us, and uh, we trust that as we worship God together, we will indeed know his presence. I see some folk from Kirkcaldy, and there's others from Aberdeen, and some from elsewhere. It's good, good, good to have you with us. But a special welcome to Ian Hepburn, who's uh, coming home. Uh, to us here in St. Columbus. It's good to have Ian and Mary and all the family uh, with us, and Ian's going to be uh, sharing God's Word with us this morning. There is Sunshine Club uh, for uh, the children immediately after the second singing, and our evening service at 6.30 in the hall. We will continue our studies in Revelation chapter 5. No Boys Brigade, Girls Brigade or Toddler Group uh, is at school holidays this week. Thursday we have our midweek at 7.30 in the hall as usual. And uh, if you haven't uh, already got your copy uh, of the Hepburn's latest newsletter, there are, are copies available in the vestibule and also the Slavic Gospel, the latest April-May newsletter, Frontlines, is there if you wish to collect a copy as you leave. And also the May, June, July word for today. Copies are available in the vestibule. So if you want to help yourself as you leave, feel free to do so. But Ian, we're delighted to have you. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And we do assure you of our continuing prayers and support as you continue to prepare for moving to Namibia. So every blessing for you, Good morning. Uh, please don't feel left out uh, as, as I waved to lots of members of my family kind of scattered throughout the church. If you didn't get a wave, uh, it's nothing personal. Uh, just kind of saying hello to uh, such a, an extended family here this morning. And it's good to see each and every one of you. It's always a delight to be home. Um, I say that, I mean, uh, I see you've put the weather on especially for me uh, as I was coming up. I was uh, laughing uh, with Mr. Heenan. I was saying, you know, uh, later on this morning, we'll be talking about uh, Jesus talking about, you know, the fishers of men. And maybe it would be more appropriate to be doing one of the stillings of the storm given uh, what we're doing at the moment uh, but it is nonetheless really good to be amongst you once again so we're going to uh, start off by singing uh, from a psalm and we're going to sing how lovely is thy dwelling place from psalm 84 
Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, our Creator and King, as we come before you, we do indeed praise your name. As those who are redeemed, as those who are washed in the blood, we sing in awe and in gratitude and in adoration. We pray, O oh Lord, that as recipients and witnesses of the power of the gospel in our lives, that the story of our lives would be one of praise. Praise from our lips, but also from our actions. That we would live lives that do inspire others to praise you. To praise the one who hears our cries, who is safe to, to save us, who reaches out in mercy and saving power, opening up the eyes of the blind and setting the captive free. We come before you this morning, amazed at what you have done for us. It is a wondrous thing that we can stand here today in the knowledge that our names are written, indeed carved into the very hands that made the universe, that the voice who called into being the whole of creation calls us by name, that you who is almighty tenderly calls to us who are so fragile and transient. We thank you for the wonder that is salvation. So we recognize that it is not just supposed to be an altered eternal destination, but a change here and now, an opportunity to have a gracious God in the place of what would have been overwhelming fear. To have you as our rock, instead of being thrown all about by every passing wave of life. To have you as our shield and our comforter through all the toils and travails that we encounter. We thank you, O Lord, that when you look at us, you don't see what we see. You see something precious, something valuable, something that you describe as precious jewels, the valuation of which you consider to be the greatest price ever paid. We humbly thank you that you have raised us up to be your children, joint heirs with Christ, that we're divested of the filthy rags of our own righteousness, and instead we are clothed <coughs> in righteous robes. And as such, O oh Lord, I ask that you help us to act like it, to think, as it were, from the heavenly places, to not be overcome by the distractions of the world, to see that you are the king of our lives, of the world, and everything that has been made and will be made. So, Lord, as we come once again before you in this place, we ask that the, the songs that we sing would come from our hearts, that they'd be evident when we leave, so that others would praise you and all of it for your glory. In Jesus' wonderful and precious name, amen. <clears throat> now then, <clears throat> excuse me. I've got a, 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 a talk that is it's, it's kind of titled children's talk, but anyone can join in, uh, bear in mind at this point. <clears throat> um, one of the things I like doing when I come home my kids will testify to this, but one of the things I like doing when I come home is going on a boat. I don't mean the boat, uh, when it, when it kind of get me here, but I like to go on a cousin's boat. And very often we come home, I get to phone him up, and we get to go out on the boat, and the kids normally come with me, they don't normally have a choice, uh, and they get to come with me onto this boat. So, when we go on the boat, we're not just simply sightseeing, we normally go fishing. Uh, we normally go and try to catch something. Now, what do we use when we normally try and catch fish? There's some things that we normally... Elijah, give me a big, loud voice. What might we use to catch a fish? What do we normally use to try and catch fish, to get them out of the water? Because when we're in the boat, I don't like just kind of putting my hands in and hoping for the best. What do we use to take them out of the water? Oh, good one, Ezra. A net. Yes, we could use a net. We could maybe get a big net, yeah? Kind of throw in the net, try and catch some fish, kind of pull them out of the water, yeah? Is there anything else that we might use to catch fish? Fishing rods. Fishing rods. Yeah, you could use a fishing rod, yes? Very sophisticated, nice, yes? Using a fishing rod, yeah? Anything else, Harry? Um, well, you could use a rope. I can use what? Rope. A rope. Sometimes, actually, especially with the little hooks all the way down the rope, yes, yeah. Like when we're going for like squid and, and things like that, yeah. Good, yeah, and creels. Big creels, like you want to catch lobsters and crabs and things, so sometimes use creels. You know, that's my particular favourite, as it were. And so we, we go out, we try and catch fish. That's usually the, 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 the main purpose, as it were. In fact, the very first fish I ever caught was in a creel by accident. 
uh, you know, and they managed to pull it up as expecting a lobster. Turns out they could a big fish instead. The very first fish I ever caught was in a creel. Now, <clears throat> I, I say this um, because <clears throat> as, as much as things have changed since I grew up doing these things, because the reason I like going out is it reminds me of the things I used to do when I was younger. And although many things have changed, actually, when you're on the boat, things haven't really changed at all. The same sights, the same smells, the same things, same sounds, and it all comes back to you. Now, a number of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. And the text that I'll be preaching on later on this morning is about uh, uh, these fishermen. There were two sets of brothers. You've got Andrew and Peter, and you've got James and John. And they're all fishermen. This is what they did for a living. And uh, there's, there's uh, one uh, point <clears throat> that they're using their, their boats. They're on their boats. They're not in the Minch. They're in the Sea of Galilee. And they're using these nets to catch fish, etc. It's not going well. And they kind of come back into shore. And Jesus goes into one of their boats. And he's in the boat because he's trying to, to teach people. And it's getting crowded. So he goes onto the boat. He sits down in the boat. And he's able to teach from the boat. And everyone's listening. And when he's finished... He says to Peter, right Peter, head out a wee bit and put your net back out. Now Peter has been at it all night and he's got nothing. Can you imagine that? All night with the nets, not one fish. And Jesus says, right, you know, we'll go out, we'll put the net down. And you, know, you can almost imagine the look that Peter's given him. <laughs> you know, here's the professional fisherman and saying, <laughs> we've been at this all night. And it's really emphasized that we haven't caught one thing. Not one thing. But I, I can almost imagine the look that Jesus is giving because Peter then follows it up with, but if you say so, we'll go and do it. <laughs> and out they go. They take the boats out. He knows there's something special about Jesus. He goes out. They put the nets over. And in an instant, they catch all these fish. In fact, they catch so many fish that the second boat, the one with James and John, has to kind of come over as well. And they have to get it all in. And even then, you know, the, the nets are almost breaking, the boats are almost sinking, and they manage to get in with more fish than they could have ever imagined. And as they come out, the, Peter in particular recognises there's something different about Jesus. He, this guy is special. And he falls down in front of him. And Jesus gives him this curious phrase. He says, once you follow me, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. That's a great phrase. Now, I know I've got to do the sermon properly later on, or we're going to have people running up and down Church Street with nets trying to catch people, you know, so I've got to make sure to do the sermon properly later on. But that's not what he meant. That's not what he meant by fishers of men. Jesus is going to get these guys to go out and he's going to capture them, as it were. Just like you would capture fish. Because he's going to have more people following Jesus. There's something about us that's supposed to be captivating when we go out. There's something about us that's to be alive, having met with Jesus. There's to be something about us which is captivating, which captures people. Whereby they say, yeah, there is something about you. And this is what happens to Peter and the rest. They go and turn the world upside down because they'd met Jesus, because they become fishers of men. And in actual fact, that's our calling as well, no matter what your size. That's our calling as well. We're not too young, and good news, you can never be too old for that to be our calling for us today. Now we're going to sing again, uh, and then you guys are going to get to go to your sunshine club. So we're going to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
Now, our reading uh, this morning uh, comes from the, the book of Math, uh, sorry, Mark, uh, chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be reading from verses 14 all the way through to 20. So it's Mark chapter 1, uh, uh, verse 14 to 20. So a relatively short reading this morning. <clears throat> this is what it says. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brothers, uh, sorry, Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you just now, and we, we bring this congregation before you. We bring each of the people here before you. Uh, Lord, you are aware, fully aware of all that we face, all that vexes us, all the things we have in front of us, the things that give us a cause for thanksgiving, the things perhaps we need to be reminded to be thankful for, and also all of the, the, the trials, all of the difficulties that life throws at us, all of the, the brokenness and the pain that comes because we live in a world that is fundamentally broken, fallen. Uh, Lord, in that we come before you and we pray for the, for the Adam family, we pray for Annette and Mary and Andrew and Alistair in particular at this time. Lord, we know what it is to live in a broken world and very often the shards of the, the pain of that and the full realization of that when that, that interloper of death has come into creation. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who defeated death, that you are the one who will raise us up. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless them and you bless each of us who have been touched by death in this last week. For those, those of us who are mourning friends, for those of us who have lost family recently, Lord, I pray that you would bless us, that you would bless us with the knowledge of your presence with us as we go back out into that broken world, but with a Savior who promises one day to wipe away the tears, tears that are rightly shed now, but wiped away by your hand. Lord, we pray for this congregation. Lord, we pray for those of us who are able to hear this message that is coming. Lord, we, we pray as we get ready to hear from your word that we will do so with a sense of wonder, and that we would gain, that we would receive from you. Lord, we thank you that it is you who has paid the price, that Christ would die on the cross, that we would be yours, that we could boldly approach your throne with our cries and our tears and our praise, that we get to approach you not through our goodness, not through our own efforts, which would just leave us so spectacularly short. Instead, Lord, we thank you that though we cannot save ourselves, we cannot see ourselves restored. We cannot force out of the, the text wisdom, Lord. We thank you that because of you, we can respond, that we can receive, that we can be the people we're called to be. So help us then as we come to your word today to see what it is that you're saying, to receive and to be changed by it. For those of us who need to be encouraged, I pray that we would hear that. For those of us who need to be challenged. For those of us who simply just need to receive, to be inspired, to be excited by you. I pray, Lord, that that is what we'd receive this morning. So we would exit this place and stride on with you through the week that lies before us, we pray. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Now we're going to sing one more time before we uh, turn back to the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to sing Glory Be to God the Father. <laughs>
<laughs> now, as I mentioned earlier this morning, I really want us to, to focus on this phrase, fishers of men, uh, found here in the calling of these four disciples. It is a calling with real potency, particularly in the context of the verses that came just before it. Uh, so it means that this phrase, as fishers of men, I want to look at mindful really of four things. We have to be aware that this is in the context of John having been handed over to the authorities. It's in the context of it being in the region of Galilee. There's the symbolism of the sea, and ultimately what it really means when we have this word gospel. Now, usually when we see this phrase, fishers of men, uh, we think that Jesus is simply being a bit clever with his words. You know, they happen to be fishermen, and so Jesus says, I'll make you fishers of men. You know, as if, as if they'd been uh, farmers, they'd been harvesters of men, maybe if they were soldiers, they'd be in the army of God. You know, just a clever play on words. And so we end up flattening this call. We just kind of skip over it, as it were. And we don't really kind of feel the resonance of such a phrase being applied to these people at this time. And being an Old Testament uh, person, uh, as a, a lecturer in Old Testament, uh, my, my, my opinion, my biased opinion, is because we divorce it from those foundational Old Testament texts that Jesus was aware of, that the disciples were aware of. And so when we read about this phrase in the Old Testament, the fishers of men, when we're aware of the dark and sinister iconography of, of, of the waters and the seas, we see what's going on in Mark. We see exactly what Jesus is calling them to. And so we will consider this this morning. We'll look at uh, some of the Old Testament. Uh, we'll get to see what this phrase means, uh, what it meant to be in the context of the sea and in Galilee in particular. And so what it meant to these people who heard that they would be called to become the fishers of men. There is always a, a temptation, um, maybe arguably elsewhere rather than a place like this, but there's always a temptation to cast these fishermen as being maybe ignorant or unschooled because they're fishermen. Now, that'd be a very brave thing for me to try and suggest in a place like Stornoway. Uh, I've always found it slightly odd that, that this would be the view. I've not found that to be the case. I find that somewhat, not just offensive, but incredulous. When you actually think of the fishing communities around Scotland, they're usually some of the most biblically literate ones. And so I think that such an assumption of their ignorance is unnecessary. These people are not biblically illiterate. They know their Bibles. As children, these men were expected to know the first five books of the Bible off by heart by the time they got to 12 years old. Now, the idea uh, was that you would learn the text as a child and then it would take you the rest of your life to begin to understand it. But if you've ever read First Peter, or if you've ever read the incredible complexity of a gospel like John's, uh, there's no way that these are illiterate, unschooled men. These men know their Bibles. They knew their Old Testament. They would have been aware of what Jesus was saying when he called them fishers of men for the task of spreading the gospel. So, uh, verses 14 to 15 provide this context for us for our section this morning. Uh, so we will start there. So verse 14 and 15, let's uh, do that again. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That is a summary statement of the ministry of Christ. This is what he's about. Announcing the kingdom of God, proclaiming the good news, calling people to repent and to believe. And in actual fact, in the book of Mark, this is really the introduction to Act 1, the first real major segment of the book. Uh, the next several chapters will follow this and be governed by this theme. And his ministry particularly takes place around Galilee. This is where he preaches and proclaims and heals and calls people to repent and to believe. And so it means that these two verses are the foundations 
uh, not just for our passage 16 to 20, but in actual fact, the, the whole of this section. It helps us understand what Jesus is doing when he calls his people to be fishers of men. When he calls them to have the same purpose that he has. They're to follow him with his message of gospel. And so we need to think about that. We need to think about what gospel means, and we don't need to look at this we need to look at this context that we find ourselves in. So, verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, that's our opening point. John the Baptist has been arrested. And uh, interestingly, that word arrested, the Greek term, uh, paradidomai, um, it, 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 some, some translations will have, you know, after it been handed over. And this word is placed here as, as a foreshadow. It's the same word that's going to be applied for Jesus, later on in Mark, uh, Mark 9, 31, 10, 33, it's, it's used when Jesus himself is handed over. And so you've got this kind of this foreshadowing. There's been this handing over. And Jesus is going to proclaim, like John, and like John, he too is going to be handed over to the authorities, handed over to death. And so the arrest of John that's mentioned here isn't just in passing, it's not just a time reference, it's a foreshadowing of the fate of the one that he had prepared the way for. And so, carrying that verse, Jesus came into Galilee. So the setting for this call is Galilee. These men are Galileans. This is the setting for Jesus' early ministry. We'll see it over the next few chapters. This is where Jesus was. Now, you may well know that Galilee uh, was a region controlled by Herod, it was uh, the, the bit, as it were, with a significant Gentile population. This is what it was known for. Uh, in fact, it was so heavily Gentile that in Matthew 4, 15, it's known as uh, you know, Galilee of the Gentiles. In John 7, the religious leaders are utterly dismissive of the idea that the Messiah could possibly come from Galilee, this Gentiled area. As soon as you read Galilee, you're supposed to know that you are in the Gentile world. This is not Jerusalem, it's not the rest of Judah. This is in the Gentile world. And really interesting, you know, Jesus uh, will predominantly go to all the Jewish settlements in this area. Uh, there's no record of him going to Sephoris, which is the Roman town, four miles away from Nazareth. You know, there's no record of him do- doing this. He goes to the Jewish areas, these Jewish enclaves in this widely Gentile area. Now, his main ministry as Messiah is to the Jews. This, he'd been long promised to the Jews. But it's not restricted there. And we will see it go well beyond, particularly after his death, from Judah and beyond, all the way out to Stornoway eventually. But as soon as you hear the word G- uh, Galilee, you have to think Gentiles. Because that's what the original hearers would have done. Clearly, that's how everyone else responds. You say Galilee, you're thinking Gentiles. Yeah, that's going to be important. Uh, the rest of that verse says, you know, proclaiming the gospel of God. You know, it's important, you know, when we hear the gospel, uh, we know that as good news, uh, quite rightly. Uh, Evangelion, you know, as, as it were, the good news. Um, but it's only, we only call it good news because we know what the news is. <laughs> we call it good news because we know that it's about the victory of Jesus Christ over sin and death. Uh, we know it is this wonderful opportunity for us to be saved because of what he has done. So we know that it is good news. And so we often just think of the gospel as good news. But this is at the beginning of his ministry. And it comes from, from a, a Hebrew uh, idea, basora. And the Hebrew word is a little bit more general. It just means news. There is news. And you're kind of waiting to hear, is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? There is news coming. More specifically, uh, this was uh, usually news coming from a battlefield. You know, when you hear the word gospel, when you hear the word basora, for example, you're supposed to think to yourself, this is the news that has come from a battle. Uh, so, uh, kind of, in the Old Testament, um, uh, 2 Samuel 18, you had these runners, these really fit guys who at the end of the battle would run and tell people, uh, you know, the news of the battle. And in that battle against, uh, when David was fighting against Absalom, David is waiting for news. He's sitting waiting for news. And of course, these runners come with this news from the battle. And as they're approaching, you know, everyone's wondering, is it going to be good news or bad news? They're on tenterhooks. They're waiting for this news. This battle news, news 
from the battlefield. And when the disciples are being called to gospel, they're being called to be the ones who will bring the news from a battle. And because we know the outcome, we get to call it good news. But it's not just simply news. It's not just simply interesting. It's this defining, this life-defining, world-changing, battlefield accounts. And the Old Testament lays the ground with this battle news. Um, Isaiah specifically says, actually, that the Messiah is going to come with this news from a battle in, in Isaiah 61.1. There's going to be this proclamation. This news is going to be proclaimed. And what is it he's proclaiming? He's proclaiming the victory of God over all of his enemies and the establishment of his kingdom. That's what Isaiah had been promising. Isaiah has been promising that the Messiah is going to come, and when he comes, he's going to be telling everybody. He's going to have this proclamation, this news of the battle, that his ministry is about the defeat of sin and death and the establishment of his kingdom. So when the disciples are being called to follow him, when they're being called into this gospel ministry, it's because there is a battle. There is to be this victory by God through the Messiah, whose enemies are going to be placed under his feet. And that's important. This is what Jesus is doing. This is what is being meant when it says that he is proclaiming the gospel of God. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. He is proclaiming the gospel of God. He is announcing the establishment of the kingdom. It means that when Mark writes these verses, he is saying, the Messiah has come. The time is fulfilled. He is proclaiming a victory that he's going to achieve through himself. And the military background to gospel sees that there is this inherent victory of Christ that he is going to achieve. And so Jesus says that the time is fulfilled. Now, there's different ways of, of, of talking about time. Greek has got more than one word for time. It's got chronos, where we get the word chronology from, um, the passing of time, you know, that linear movement from one time to another. There's another word, kairos, which is a different understanding of time. It's that perfect moment, that God-ordained time for something. Just split second perfect. And that's what we have here. The time that God has ordained for something to happen. Here Jesus is talking about the kairos. There is a time and now it is fulfilled. Now this God-ordained prophetically promised time has arrived. The time of Messiah has arrived. It is now, and now we have this gospel. Now we have this ministry of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. And that's the background to the text. That's what we have, just now, that almost throwaway line about Jesus in verses 14 and 15. This is the ministry that he's all about. And that then brings us to the next section, 16 to 20. So passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So, as Jesus passes here on his gospel mission, he sees two sets of brothers, and he calls them to follow him. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men, which kind of brings us to the main point. What does he mean by fisher of men? You know, as I was saying earlier, it's not just a clever play on words. There's something deeper going on here. You see, the Old Testament prophets spoke a lot about being fishers of men. And I think this is where we need to look to understand what Jesus is saying. We could start with um, Jeremiah 16, 16. Uh, Behold, I'm sending for many fishers, and fishers of men, declares Yahweh, and they shall catch them, and afterwards I'll send for many hunters, and they will hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rock. 
And in Jeremiah, God is to send fishermen and hunters, uh, kind of a parallel here, and they're to gather in the people because there's going to be a new exodus. Um, there's going to be judgment. Uh, all of their idolatry is going to be dealt with, these people, and uh, before this, this time of exodus. And this great gathering of people is, is a time of rejoicing. It's a, it's a remarkable thing, but it does come with an element of judgment. Uh, and so these fishes of men are not entirely positive, if, if, you, if you want to think of it that way. You know, yes, they're bringing you into this new life. They're bringing you into this new exodus, but there's going to be judgment. And that's similar to how this same phrase is used in Habakkuk 1, 14 to 16, where the Babylonians are sent out to be the fishers of men, coming to catch people like fish with their hooks and their nets and their dragnets. We also have God sometimes described as a fisher of men. Um, so, for example, uh, Ezekiel uh, 32, 3, uh, God uses this dragnet, and, and very much uh, he's going to punish people like Pharaoh, and he's going to punish the enemies, and so, um, like in Jeremiah, you know, he sends people, uh, and other times it will be himself who is this fisher of men. The point is, in all of the examples of the fishers of men in the Old Testament, there's always an element of judgment. Um, you see, again, in, in Amos 4, verse 2, when it says that God, Yahweh, will punish those who oppress the poor, because he's going to come as a fisher of men and take them away with hooks and fish hooks. So again, uh, God being presented doing the fishing. The point is that if you take them all together, all these examples of fishers of men in the Old Testament, it's actually quite a violent image. It involves judgment. It very often involves punishment. The fishers are to catch the people for the judgment of God. But the main point, actually, is that when you are fished for, when you are the fish, you are taken. You're taken away from the life that you know into a completely different world something that is completely new. The life that you knew is over, and it's a completely different life now. What is coming is going to be very different from anything that went before. And that's the main point. It's an act of judgment that will take you away from the former life and set you on a life that is new. Whether it's going off into exile with the Babylonians, uh, whether it's the, the new exodus in Jeremiah, you are taken from this old life, this old world, put into a new world, a new life that you could never have imagined, and that there is judgment taking you from one to the other. Now, that's one insight from the Old Testament. That's one of the components we need to be mindful of as we come to this phrase, fishers of men. But it's also important that we understand how the Old Testament even just viewed the sea. The call in Mark takes place beside the Sea of Galilee, but the sea is not a neutral thing. It's actually really important in the context of fishers of men. When you look at the sea through Old Testament eyes, what do we see? Well, actually, the Old Testament very often would use nature um, or geographical features such as mountains and valleys. They, they take on symbolic uh, relevance. You know, it's not just a mountain. It takes on something. That's particularly the case when it comes to the sea. The seas and the oceans were essentially symbolic of two things. Very often the seas and the oceans would represent, again, the Gentiles, and other times it would represent chaos, disorder, death. Throughout the Old Testament, the sea and the sea creatures are emblematic of the Gentile world. We see this in the Psalms in particular, uh, where you know, we can be delivered from the waters, meaning delivered from the Gentiles. Um, we see that in um, uh, Psalm 144, verse 7. Isaiah, in Isaiah 17, 12, talks about the thundering and roaring of the Gentiles like mighty rushing waters. Gentile rulers are likened to great aquatic oceanic creatures. Um, Daniel 7, uh, Isaiah 51, 9. In fact, that's why, in John, um, that's why John in, in Revelation 17, 15 has his vision of the mighty waters, uh, and these are the enemies, these are the nations of the world arrayed against the people of God. And so the first thing is, as soon as you hear the words waters and seas and things, you're supposed to think, once again, Gentile world. Those who do not know God. Those who would be antagonistic to God. Those who would be a threat to the life of the people of God. And it is also a world of chaos and disorder and death. You see, the idea of the sea being 
chaotic, dangerous, uh, a danger to your life. That's not an image I have any problem with. <laughs> I mean, if you're to, if you're to you know, go past the harbour on the way home today, you'll kind of get the idea. You know, uh, very often, uh, people who don't live near, near the sea, you know, they'll see like a postcard, for example, and it looks very pretty, and it can be. It can be very, very beautiful. And even then, you need to be careful. There are certain beaches you don't go swimming on. There are certain places you don't go out to. This sea is a dangerous place. You need to treat it with respect. For the Israelites... The sea is a place of confusion and chaos and judgment and death. We see that in the day of Noah. We see it in the crossing of the Red Sea, where the water will become the grave for the pursuing Egyptians. Uh, when Jonah uh, flees, he takes a ship, uh, and you know, the, the, the storm comes to the, to the extent that life is now in danger. The ship is in danger of being destroyed. The Psalms liken threats of enemies to the roarings of the sea, Psalm 65.2. The disciples in the New Testament are caught out in a storm and almost die twice. Luke 21, 25, the roaring of the waves is the sign of the second coming. In the creation account of Genesis uh, and in the, the glassy sea around the throne in Revelation, God, who can control even the sea, is shown to be sovereign. So let's put that all together. In the Old Testament, fishing for men is a largely violent image, one of judgment that takes you from one life to another. In the Sea of Galilee, where you would see intense storms, you have the imagery wrapped up of the Gentile world, both in the word sea and Galilee. And it was also a dangerous, chaotic place, the sea. It was a place of death. And so when Jesus comes to these brothers, they're fishing there, at the side of the sea. These, these men who can be fishers of men, it's not just a clever play on words. If I was to sum it up, it'd be like this. In the Gentile region of Galilee, Jesus has begun his worldwide mission. The mission is going to go even to the sea, even to the Gentiles. Even the Gentiles are going to be reached by this Messiah. The gospel message that he is proclaiming is news of a war, of a battle. It is news of his victory through the active reign of God, described as his kingdom. He's going to use these men in a role as fishers of men. Because what they are going to do is they're going to go to the watery places of death. And they're going to capture people and bring them into the world of life. They're going to turn everything on its head. They're going to take people away from the world that they know and bring them into this new world as followers of Jesus Christ. And the violence of judgment still exists. But it is a judgment that Christ takes upon himself. He takes that judgment. He takes that cost. He takes that price on himself so that the people who live in the watery places of death the Gentiles who do not know God would get to know him. When they're called to be fishers of men, they're called to be part of a conflict, a war, a battle that's saving lives. As they spread the gospel message that Jesus has actually won, that he has this victory over sin and death, when they declare the active reign of the kingdom of God, when they bear testimony that God has worked in them, that God would work through them. When they give testimony that they themselves have been changed, they themselves have been taken out of the waters, that they themselves now live a new life. When they face the sinister deep, the chaos and sin of this world, when they do all these things, this is what it means to be a fisher of men. They faced it. We read about it. We read about what they did in the book of Acts. And we get to experience it today in the wars and the battles that surround us. Because there should be wars and battles when you're coming with this battle news of victory, when you proclaim the gospel. And so this calling was not just 
to Peter and his brother. It wasn't just to those who were professional fishermen. It's not just a clever play on words. Jesus is saying, the Old Testament warned you that I'm going to be calling a people who would be willing to go out even into the sea, the Gentile world, those who do not know God, in order to see lives changed. In the power of Christ who has achieved victory, the one who took all the judgment onto himself, we are, we are called to be fishers of men. And as I said to the kids earlier on, if you're running up and down with a net on Church Street, that's not what I mean. But we are to be captivating. We are to be the kinds of people that sees lives taken from death to life. Real life. That's what it means to be a fisher of men. It's actually a really violent role because you're asked to take part in this battle to take part in a struggle between good and evil, between death and sin and life with Christ. But it's also an activity filled with the grace of God because ultimately we follow Him. Now, it's not to be done in our own strength. It's not to be done simply in our own wisdom. But we are to reach out to the world because that is what He does. He chooses us to go and do that job. To see people who are trapped in chaos and death come into the world of life. And it is a serious and yet wondrous and wonderful calling given to each of us this morning, that we get to take part, that we would get to take part in being these fishers of men, that wonderfully violent, life-changing calling. And I pray that this is indeed what we will experience in the days ahead. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that though the, the world can distract us, though the things of life can numb us sometimes to the reality, we do, Lord, thank you that what we are talking about is indeed life. Not just uh, eternal life, uh, some day, a way off possibly in the future, but a, a life that changes us even now. And so, Lord, we do pray that though we are often worn down, though we are often distracted, though we are often forgetful that this is what we are called to. I pray, O Lord, that this week, that we be mindful that we are those who are indeed called to be fishers of men, that we are indeed those who are supposed to have been transformed, O Lord, that we would be people of life, so that when we go into the world, when we go to places that are marked by sin and death, that we would be different, that we would indeed be captivating, that people would be captured, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that we cannot do that ourselves, because uh, what a burden that would be. But we pray, oh Lord, that we would indeed be that wonderful witness for you, that we would indeed be these fishers of men, so that when we do finally reach glory, that we would see this vast multitude and see people there that were reached by you because you called us to go out with your nets and take in the people, Lord, we pray. So Lord, bless us to that endeavor, overcome all of our weaknesses. And let us be people transformed by your life. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So we're going to sing uh, one last time. And it's uh, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.